we're in a series that most of you have probably heard about, Relationship Goals. And when we started this series, it was six weeks long, and then God extended it to eight weeks. As I've been studying, I wanted to go 15 weeks, but we're not going to do that, okay? I feel like God is, is, is closing what he wants to say right now in this series. And, and, and we started talking about sex last week. And um, no matter if we accept it or not, it's something that touches all of our lives. Um, sex, sexuality, the images that we're dealing with in our heart, in our mind, what has happened to us, what was taken from us, what we were exposed to in a manner that was not godly. Whatever it is, you know what it is. I don't know what it is. You act like it don't happen, but it's affecting you. It's all over your life. And the church usually doesn't talk about it. We just say things like God will use it for good, but I, I've, I've not given it to the father for real i haven't totally surrendered all of it and so usually what ends up happening is i'm walking around with issues problems burdens thoughts hurts pains that i'm kind of made to feel as a believer i should have already dealt with and that should already be coming we say um um scriptures like you know any man that be in christ he's a new creation and 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 the old things have passed away behold all things are new but what happens that, that we don't realize many times is at that moment, your spirit becomes new. But you're a three-part being. So your spirit automatically at that moment is brand new, but your body didn't get the memo. So there's fleshly desires and things that are happening that you're like, I'm new. But why am I wanting to do this old thing? And so that's why we have to get into this place, and the, the name of this church is Transformation Church, because Romans tells us that, that we are supposed to continually be renewed in our mind. Like, as we continually renewed in our mind, we can end up doing, be transformed, not, not by what the world is doing, but the renewing of our mind through God's word. And then we'll be able to know the good and acceptable will of God for us. So what we are in right now is we get a spiritual transformation, but then we have to have an emotional and a, and a body transformation transformation and one of the huge things that happens to us is that we never are able as believers Christians to manage this area of sexuality and sex and and, and honestly it's because we don't do enough talking about it your education is coming from people places and things that aren't connected to the Savior and so what ends up happening is we're trying to manage something that God uh, has has all the answers to, but we're not going to afford it. And I just decided that Transformation Church was going to be a church that deals with what people are dealing with and sees what God is saying about it and so that we can get free. So today, as we continue, we're going to kind of pick up where we left off. I'm sorry for everybody who did not hear last week's message, but I'm going to try to run us through just the bullet points so that you can be in the know and then you can go back and watch all of the messages from this entire series on our app or the website, and we want you to do that. But last week, we talked about how sex was God's idea. Sex was not Trey Song's idea, talking about he invented sex. No, he didn't, okay? <laughs> sex was God's idea, okay? And, 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 and that's where our fundamental problem is because most things that we think about sex, even how it's presented for parents and all this other stuff, it, it's a nasty thing. I was, <laughs> yesterday, my father-in-law, he, he's, he's a big man. He serves in the parking lot. Y'all see him out there, Big Craig. And, and we were outside, and I was doing something, and I almost hurt myself at uh, my little daughter's birthday party. He said, uh-uh, Pastor Mike, get off of there. He said, I want to hear my message about S-E-X tomorrow. I said, you're 58 years old. You, you, you could have said sex. <laughs> but I want you to see how it's branded into our psyche. That it's something we don't talk about. It's something we don't really go right for. We got to spell it instead of say it. And it's because I believe that we got it perverted somewhere that sex was a bad thing. And it's God's idea. Okay. But then it comes to the second point we talked about last week. Sex has been perverted. And that's the enemy's plan to take anything that God calls is good and to make it bad. Like, I want you to understand that. The Bible tells us in John 10.10 10, that this, the enemy um, only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And a lot of us read it like this. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The Bible says he doesn't come unless he can steal, kill, and destroy. And, and, and I want you to see that. 
That, that's what he wants to do in the area of your sexuality, in your area of purity, in the area of you reaching purpose. So sex has been perverted. Can we be honest that in our society, it's the most sexually charged generation that has ever been? I was, I, I was watching a, a burger commercial for Carl's Jr., and this woman was eating a burger in the most sensual way. I ain't never seen nobody eat a burger like that. <laughs> She's in a bikini on top of a car, ketchup dripping off of her. I said, this, this is regular. This, this, but it wasn't about the burger. It was about appealing to my flesh so that I become desensitized. And that's the enemy's plan for you is if you can see enough images and you can hear enough okay stories and you can be okay with enough abuse and you can be okay that you will be desensitized. So when it comes to your house, you'll be more willing to let it in. Can I help you? That's why the enemy started bombarding most of us in this room by age three or four. Because he knew if he had 20 years to break down your walls, by the time you were 24, he could take your life. And this is the great thing that I, that, that, that I found. Um, the enemy is not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere at the same time. So what he does is set up systems to keep us entangled. So the sexual sins that you're in is you spinning a web that you can't get off. And he says, oh, yeah, leave Trey right there. He'll be fine for the next 30 years. Leave Sarah right there. She's so broken in her mess that I don't even got to mess with her. She's going to keep herself occupied. She's going to keep inviting that bad boy into her life. She's going to keep because she is now has a perverted image of what God wants for her life. And so sex has been perverted. And, and, and we, we found out last week that because sex has been perverted, God had to create a container for it because it's so powerful and so amazing and what God wants. And it's good when it's done in his time. He created a container because we know that power with no container can destroy all kinds of things. We've seen what's happening with the floods and all this other thing that's happened. That's power. That's water without a container. But power under control or contained can produce life for an entire city. And that's what sex is in your life. If you put sex in the container that God built for it, marriage between one man and one woman, then it produces a life-giving force. And so because now we have this container of sex, last week we ended service by surrendering our sexuality. I mean, and I don't know if y'all stayed for everything that was happening, but we was here for an hour after service and people were up here getting delivered healed set free saying i've never told anybody this in my whole life but this is what happened to me this is where it started for me this has been the cycle and they were just laying it all out there saying i didn't i even forgot i i didn't even know this was affecting me and we were laying it and listen it gets to continue today and it gets to continue tonight listen you do not want to miss tonight i'm not saying that because we're just trying to have a an event tonight will be the picture of God cutting you loose from everything that has held you down. And, and as I go through this, this message, there are many of us that have, have things that have been holding us back from God's best. And so today I want to pick up there, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. And, and this is where we're going to pick up. We read a story last week about Paul trying to talk to believers who have come to the faith and they believe in Jesus, their eternity is, is secure, but they're living in this sexually charged generation like we are today. I mean, you cannot scroll through Facebook and Instagram with having to un without having to unfollow at least one person, at least for me. If I'm on there for, I got him like, why did you post that? Like, I can't look at you no more. Get out of here. And some of you leave it up there because they post some good stuff, but all the enemy needs is one entrance. One. You find yourself doing things at times where nobody knows. God's saying, that's not what I want for you. If you would allow me to come in and heal these areas of your life, I can make you free and free indeed. So this is what Paul's talking about. He's talking to a bunch of dudes who are coming out of this sexually uh, uh, charged area. And, and I told you all last week, it's kind of like the equivalent of the Las Vegas Strip. 
Um, today, it caters to sex. Like, if you go to Las Vegas right now and you want a prostitute, it's legal. Like, you can actually get a prostitute, not get arrested. All these different things that are happening in brothels and all this other stuff. If you're greedy and you want to gamble and all that other stuff, you cannot go to the restroom in Las Vegas. I don't know how many of y'all been there. But if you go to the restroom, there's a slot machine in the bathroom. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's catering to your sinful desires. And that's where these people are. And Paul's trying to help them deal with their faith and their sexuality. And I think this is going to help us today. Look, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. It says, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourself. And I stopped and talked about this last week, but I need to say it one more time, is that some of us, like me, before I really got a revelation, I was fooling myself. See, my eternity and my salvation was secure. I was going to heaven, but that's the lowest level of blessing that God wants for your life. Most of us just want to make it to heaven, and God said, I don't want you to just make it to heaven. I want you to dominate on earth. I want you to subdue right here. I want you to walk in the fullness of my kingdom right now, and most of us settle for just making it to heaven. I want to see the streets painted with gold. Now, after you see them and, and after you get there and, and you don't have any responsibility in heaven because you didn't steward over what you had in earth, God's saying, I don't want that for you. And I was fooling myself. I had made myself believe that God was blessing stuff that he was not even a part of. And I don't know if you're in this room like that, but I was thanking God. God, I thank you that you're blessing my, my relationship. We was doing all kind of dumb stuff. He can't bless that because God only can bless what he is in the middle of. And I want to be very frank. If you look at your life, evaluate it. If God's not in the middle of it, he can't bless it because it has to be sustained and supported. Oh, he'll save you. There, there they go again. <sighs> okay, come on, baby. Get back up. Ride it again. No, let me help you. No, I can do it myself. That's the struggle I'm having with my four-year-old right now. Trying to teach her how to learn her bike, uh, ride her bike, but she's so independent and wants to do it herself that she won't allow me to teach her to do something she's never done. Some of y'all are out here acting like you've been married before. And some of y'all have and still didn't learn how to do it. You, you got what I'm saying? Yeah. And you won't allow God to be in the middle to teach you how to do what you don't know how to do. And, and I'm just saying, don't fool yourself. Like my daughter can lie to y'all and be like, I can ride my bike. <laughs> don't fool yourself, baby. You can't ride it yet because you haven't allowed the teacher, the leader, the one who's supposed to sustain it, be in the center of it. And I want you to know that because that's what Paul's telling these people. He said, don't fool yourself. Those who indulge in sexual sin, who worship idols, commit adultery, or male prostitutes, practice homosexuality, are thieves, greedy people, drunkards, or abusive, or cheat people. None of these people are going to inherit the kingdom of God. But thank God for grace. Because some of you once were like that. I remember when I read this list for the first time, just being like, dang, that's me. That's me. Oh, Lord, that's me. That's me. And then it came to this part, and it said, and you once were like that. Can anybody thank God for his grace? Okay. Now watch. But you were cleansed. You were made holy, which means just separate. You were made right or righteous with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You made one simple action of your vocal cords and your heart, and you called on the name of Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. And these guys are sitting here like, okay, yeah, I know, but that don't, that don't really, you know, there's a monster on the inside of me, Paul. And you saying all of that, I know Jesus in me, we good. You understand what I'm saying? But this thing is roaring on the inside. And these sexual desires and these urges and these longings are there. What am I supposed to do with this? And Paul says to him, verse 12, he said, you say, I'm allowed to do anything, but everything is not good for you. Don't that sound like people? I'm grown. I don't need accountability. I don't need nobody telling me what I, I've been handling this for 36 years and I'll keep handling this for the next. You know what I'm saying? Like they get, they get like I'm grown. And that's what these guys were telling Paul. Like, I'm grown. I, I can handle myself. I know, my I know how much is enough for me. I know that we can just chill on the bed and ain't nothing going to happen. I know I can go to the bar. 
but I'm just going to get water. <laughs> you judging. This is Coke. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This is Coca-Cola. You judging me. <laughs> yeah, I know. Come on. How many of us have said to ourselves or to others, I know when enough is enough for me? Except when enough overtakes us. And our lustful desires begin to put us in positions. I don't know if you've ever said this, but I have multiple times. I never thought I'd be here. I never thought I would be feeling or acting like this. Okay? So, so that's what he's saying. And he's saying, and I know y'all, y'all say I'm allowed to do anything. We're still in verse 12. But I must not become a slave to anything. What are you a slave to this morning? What controls you? What tells you to go and you have to go? What, what tells you to move and you have to move? What makes you miss a, a, a opportunities because it's telling you to do something contrary? What are you a slave to? And then this is where we pick up. There was, it says, you say food was made for the stomach and the stomach was made for food. This is true, though someday God will do away with both of them, but you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. Now, let me stop here because I'm going to give, I'm a pastor, and so I like to teach, okay? So I'm going to teach you how I study the Bible. And my greatest desire for every one of you is that you would learn to study the Bible, not just read the Bible, but actually get in it and try to figure out what it's saying. Because if you just read that, that's confusing than a mug. It's like, okay, like and when I'm on my Bible reading, that'd be the thing six years ago, I'd just skip, skip over and just keep reading and be looking for something real simple and plain. But there's so much truth packed in this one statement, and I'm going to try to break it down to you how I study, and maybe this will help you. So when I looked at this, verse 13, I was like, what? is he talking about he said you say the food was made for the stomach and the stomach was for food um nothing okay he's eating he's hungry okay then paul says this is true though someday god will do away with both of them but you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality i am so utterly confused holy spirit you say that you're a teacher so I'm asking, me to, asking you to illuminate to me what you're trying to say through your word. You say, this is Paul talking. This is how I do it right here. Paul's talking, and he's talking to these people who are dealing with sexual sins, and they're trying to do, okay, food was made for the stomach, and the stomach for food. This is true. Oh, okay. I get it. He's saying to these people who are used to satisfying their appetites. He's like, you think that eating food, like, what do you do when you're, you're hungry? When your stomach tells you you're hungry, what do you do? You eat food. So food was made for the stomach. And that's true. He tells them it's true. But don't compare food and you satisfying your desire by just eating it because you're hungry. Don't compare that to what you're supposed to do with your bodies. Because your bodies, look what it says, but you can't say that about your bodies. Because when you're hungry, what do you do? You go to Quick Trip, you go to Chick-fil-A. Some of y'all be at Chick-fil-A every day. Wherever you go, you go, I'm hungry. I'm going to eat. And God says, but when you're horny, you can't have the same response. I'm hungry. So I'm going to satisfy that desire. Eat. I'm horny, so I'm going to satisfy that desire. No, 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 no. But you can't do that because your bodies were not made for sexual immorality. I want everybody to see this. Many of us have been fulfilling our sexual appetite because we feel it's natural. And God's saying is, you can't look at your body the same way you look at getting yourself food when you're hungry. Because that is not my plan for it. Look down as it goes a little further. It says, you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality because they were made for the Lord. And the Lord cares about your body. And let me help you understand what sexual immorality is, because this began to change me, because that's how I used to be. If I was feeling something, I called it hot and bothered. If I was hot and bothered, I was going to figure out a way to not be hot and bothered no more. 
whether that was calling somebody, whether, whether that was pleasing myself, whether that was doing, I was going to figure out, and some of y'all just got so tense and like so, but I'm going to be real, I'm coming to your house right now. Because when, when we are faced with natural desires, we try to handle them naturally. But God's saying, if you would allow me to be the one in the center of your situation, I can give you a better way that will not leave you with the consequences of your own actions if you would give it to me. So don't treat your body like you treat Chick-fil-A. Don't just go get what's going to please you for a moment. Because it wasn't made for that. God's saying to everybody that your bodies were made for me. And I love you and I care for your bodies. And some of y'all is like, okay, don't be sexual and moral. You, you don't even understand what that means. That comes from the Greek word pornea, which we get the word pornography from. And what it means basically is selling off something very valuable for cheap. So that's why. You can see young ladies and young men exposing the secret places of themselves for a dollar and selling off the thing that God calls so pure and so valuable that it's so special. You're only supposed to give it to one person that that we're selling it off for cheap. And he says, that's not what your bodies were made for. They were made to give me glory. When I look at marriage and I see a woman and a man coming and committing to each other inside of the container of marriage. And when they get in that bed, he said, I guard that bed. Yeah, they doing that. And I let them. <laughs> he said, the marriage bed is undefiled. You better hit that. You better make that work. You, what? Creativity. I'm giving my presence to you. No, no, see, y'all don't get it. He says that this is supposed to be an act of worship. See, y'all want to sing a song. I want my worship to happen right here. Do you hear me? Are you ready? This is what I'm saying to you. See, because it's been perverted. And we can't talk about this. But God says when two people come in my covenant. That's why I don't want you to pornea, sell it off for cheap. Come on, come on. That's why if somebody's saying, can we Netflix and chill, you're supposed to say, heaven no. <laughs> and you can use the other one. You have permission from your pastor. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because what you have is too valuable and wasn't made for that. That would be like me taking an iPhone 8 or an iPhone 7 or this iPad and using it as a paperweight. I have just sold the value of this equipment for cheap. And God says, when you don't invite me into this situation to handle these sexual urges, and what you do is you sell off what I called valuable. You sell it off for cheap. And Paul's trying to help these guys understand. He, he, he tells them, he says, man, you were made for the Lord, and the Lord cares about your body. And some of y'all be like, yeah, right. He cares about my body. So why did he give me all of this rage? <laughs> before I could be married, before I could do this, because he wants you dependent on him. See, most of you miss the story of the Bible. The story, the story that God's really trying to, to paint is that his love covers every one of your sins, but you can't live this life without him. And so we need God in every area of our lives. Well, Pastor Mike, that's great. He created a container for the married people. <laughs> but I'm single. Or I'm divorced. Or the pain of the thing, my purity was stolen from me. I didn't give it to somebody. They took it away from me when I was helpless and I was young. And I didn't know. So what do I do with that, Pastor Mike? What, what do I do if, if, if I'm feeling stuck right now? I have great news for you. Is that whatever pain, whatever hurt, whatever problem that you are going through right now, point number one for today is God has power over sex. And I want you to understand this because most of us don't realize this, that God has all power over everything that's going on in your life. And, and if good intentions could have changed you, it would have already changed you by now. 
If, 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 if your self-will was good, no, your self-will is worthless. I can prove it to you. You wouldn't be 300 pounds if your self-will was, was good. How many of us have started a diet and quit? You was eating quinoa and green tea and all this other stuff for three weeks. And it fell off because my good intentions will not hold me through. I need, you need, we need the power of God. The sexual addictions, problems, hurts you're going through, it's not going to be solved by wanting to do better. Just really out here, just trying to do my best, just really just trying to get it going, just trying to go after God, just, just choo-choo, just chugging along, just really trying to go after God. You need the power of God. You need the dunamis, the explosive power of God to come into your life and change you. But he can't do it if you don't allow him to. And, and, and that's what Paul was saying to these people because they got frustrated. You're going to say we can't fulfill our own desires, Paul. You don't know what we're going through. You don't know how this feels. He said, first off, yes, I do. I'm single too. <laughs> and what y'all don't know is I'm not going to get married. So, so I'm, I've been called by God to literally give a playbook to people for things that I won't even get to fully experience because it would take away from my ministry to help people for the next thousands of years. So don't tell me I don't know what it's like to sacrifice. But can I tell you that the same thing that gets me through is the same thing that gets you through? Verse 14, look what he says. He said, and God will raise us from the dead by his power. Just as he raised our Lord from the dead. Now, when I read that the first time, I'm, I'm confused again. Because I'm, I'm going back and I'm sitting here, like I, I picture movies in my head when I read the Bible. And so I'm picturing Paul standing here and there's 15 dudes over here. And they were like, man, we horny, man. I knew he ain't never had none, bro. I know he didn't because if he was talking, he wouldn't be talking like that. And Paul's over here trying to explain to them how they need to control their sexual urges. And I was like, bro, I'm leaving. And then he goes ahead and says this statement. He says, and God will raise us from the dead by his power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. And I begin to ponder on that. Why would Paul say that right there? And I want us to dig just a little deeper. What he was saying is that y'all know, y'all was there when the word came back that Jesus literally was raised from the dead. Y'all, yeah, like y'all was there and y'all believe that one day he's coming back or when we die, he is going to raise us from the dead and we're going to live forever with him in heaven. This is what you believe. So you're telling me that an all powerful God has the power to raise a dead body, but not manage a living one. Y'all. I need you to hear this one more time because this messed me up. Why did he say God has all power? He, he is, can raise Jesus from the dead and he's going to raise you from the dead. I'm telling you like he's telling you, I don't care what your problem is right now. If God can raise Jesus and raise you from the dead, how can he raise a dead body and not manage a living one? Now, listen. Well. Okay, so what I'm supposed to do now? God can manage. God can manage. He, he can get this in, under control. What you have to realize is what 1 Peter 5.10 says. It says, in his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Jesus Christ. So your eternity is secure. Like, you're going to heaven. You're, when you put your faith in Jesus, your eternity is secure. But we still have to live in these earth suits on this body. So now he's trying to give us a history. He says, so after you've suffered a little while, that's what some of y'all been in right now. Just a little bit of suffering, a little uncomfortableness, a little dealing with this flesh, a little mess up, a little thing. He said, but after you've dealt with it a little while, God, he will restore, support, and strengthen you. And I came to tell somebody today that as we give our sexuality to God, what he's going to do is not just leave you there and be like, all right, figure it out for yourself. He said, no, 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 no. I'm the God with all power. What I came to do is support, restore, and strengthen you. And some of you need to believe that because you've tried and you've tried and you've tried and you've tried, but you haven't really tried Jesus. 
You haven't really given it all to him and followed in what he wants because this is what his desire is for you in this area, that you would invite him in and he could restore support and strengthen you. And the verse goes on to say, and he will place you on a firm foundation, which 1 Corinthians 3.11 tells us that there is no foundation except Jesus Christ. And so he is going to set you on a firm foundation. And then verse 11 is my favorite part. It says, and all power is his forever. Why are you so excited about that? Because sex has power, but my God has more power. Y'all missed it. Because depression has power, but my God has all power. Because fear has power, but our God has all power. If you believe that what you were dealing with is bigger than God, stop serving him. But if you believe the God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that when he went down and snatched death's keys, it, and it, he rose with all power. Pastor Mike, what are you trying to say? That your situation is not too big. I know you've been with tons of people and things have happened to you and you've seen images you can't get out of your mind sexually and emotionally and all this. It has no match. For the power of God in your life. So look at verse 15. Because if God has all power, and through my confession of faith in Jesus Christ, he lives on the inside of me, we must be missing something. Because he got all power, he on the inside of me, but I feel powerless. Can we be honest? There's sometimes that we feel completely powerless. Paul says it like this, when I want to do right. Wrong is right there. Like, why do I feel like this? And then 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15 says this other, this three-word phrase that they keep saying. It says, don't you realize that your body, you may not know this, but your bodies are actually parts of Christ. What? Hold on, stop now. Did you just tell me that my body is a part of Christ? So what that means is God is not watching what we're doing from a camera like Big Brother and watching what we're doing, evaluating. He's right here with us, doing it with us. And Paul's telling these guys, I don't think y'all realize this. And I didn't realize this until God gave me revelation. See, it said, you, um, should a man take his body, which is a part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. Let me give you some context of the day. Where they were, there were a thousand prostitutes in the temple, like in a church, ready to do whatever they wanted at any moment. That was common practice. That would be like you coming to church trying to live sexually pure, and there's a thousand prostitutes in here worshiping, just ready for you. Just, <laughs> just. Now, like, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, like. <laughs> This is, this is what they lived in. But he's telling them because you have been changed, even though that temptation is there, your response has to be different. He, he's letting them know, do you realize because Christ is a part of you. He is not away from you judging what you're doing and saying, come. He is in you. He is with you. You are a part. Let me so, say it slow. Christ is a part of you. A part. You are joined. You are connected. So what are you really trying to say, Pastor Mike? Every time you have sex, Christ is having it with you. It, it, it's, 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 it's one of the things that you have to realize because Paul said you, they didn't realize it and you don't realize it. That every time you're watching pornography, Christ is not somewhere off in a, he's right there with you. My question is, when you're joining to something that is not like God, is God having as much fun as you are? Is he as comfortable in that position as you are? Because we are joined with, I, I want you to get how emphatic this language is. And Paul is saying, maybe you didn't realize it. Maybe you didn't understand that when you were just having sex with your boyfriend premarital, in pre-marriage relations, that Jesus Christ, when you invited him in, cannot be separated from you. And so now you're making Christ not enjoy what you do in your life, but endure what you're doing in your life. 
And I want us to see how powerful this is. Go to um, uh, Romans, Romans chapter 8, verse 35, because after I read this scripture, it changed the perspective on a verse that I've seen for so long. Christ and me are connected. When I'm cussing somebody out, Christ is cussing somebody out. See, you don't think about that's just me. That's how I do it. That's what I'm doing. That's what I know. No, baby. You now have the God of the universe connected to you. And whatever you are doing, he does it and watches it with you. So when I looked at Romans 8.35, it says, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger? If we have sex with somebody, watch pornography, masturbate, or threatened with death? Look at verse 37. No! Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours, not because of our own good works, but through Christ who loves us. What I want you to realize is that your relationship with Christ doesn't, or your connection with Christ has nothing to do with our love for him. It has everything to do with his love for us. And it's a good thing that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Amen. He goes on to say in verse 38, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demon, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above, of, or, above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation is sex created by God. So even sexual addictions, pains, fears, all of that, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't know about you, but I am overwhelmed. And I'm thankful that my mistakes and my mishaps, my missteps, a.k.a. sin, has not separated me from the love of God. But now that we know that, we have to steward over that differently. It's a good thing that we can never be separated from the love of God. But that means when we do bad things, we can't be separated from the love of God. So Christ is there with us. And God gave me the most impactful revelation that I want to give to you. Sex and Savior can't be separated. I want you to remember this for the rest of your life. The next time you get ready to send pictures to somebody or the next time you get ready to slide into the DMs or the next time you get ready to lay in somebody's bed who's not your husband and wife, who you have not married and bring covenant, I want you to realize that you cannot separate sex and Savior. That they will be there and be an action that have to go together. Because God's love ain't going nowhere for us. And so that means Christ has to stay in us. And we do not want to be separated for one moment. Because I know who I am without Christ. And he said, there's nothing you can do. So now it's a stewardship issue. How are you going to handle the God in you? Now that you know, because I'm safe, we're connected. How are you going to handle the Christ in you? Because when we look at this, Paul goes on to continue to tell them. He goes on to try to get them to understand verse 16 because they still wasn't getting it. Like some of y'all still ain't getting it. Y'all like, Pastor Mike, you're just going way too deep right now. It is not that hard. It is not that easy. If I have sex with somebody, okay, I broke up with him. It's over. It's done. Leave me alone. I have finished that chapter of my life. Boop, close. I am finished with that. No. And Paul knows that we were going to be sitting here. And so he said, don't you realize there that phrase is again, because maybe you didn't get it. Don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her. Y'all, I want you to hear me. He didn't say if he married a prostitute. He said if he joins, if he has sex with that prostitute, if he if he. Um, um, allows himself to, to be able to be in an intimate relation with that person. They become one. For the scriptures say, the two are united into one. 
But the person who is joined, that same word, to the Lord is one spirit with him. We talked about it last week in Mark chapter 10, verse 7. This explains why a man um, leaves his mother and father and, and they are joined. That word joined is much more emphatic than what we think. Joined is not just, oh, we're holding hands and we're having a good time. When you're joined, they're talking about sexual relationship or deep emotional ties. When you're joined, it happens on three levels. It happens on a physical level. I want you to write this down because this will change the way you look at things. When you're joined to a man, joined to a woman, it happens physically through sex. Then it happens emotionally through intimacy or closeness, mind, will, body. It happens in that manner. And then it happens in covenant through the spirit. It's a body, emotion, and a spiritual act when you have sex with somebody. I talked about it in greater detail and I don't have the time today, but every time that you have sex with somebody, you are making a covenant with them. There is blood that is shed and there is blood that is exchanged in that moment. And if you study the scriptures all the way from the Old Testament to the New, there always had to be blood shed to be able to submit a covenant or cement a covenant. And so the marriage day is not the day when you guys become one. The day you become one, according to the Bible, is when you have sex with them. My question is, how many people are you one with? And I'm not coming to judge, and I'm not coming because these are the same things that God has had to deal with my heart on. But he said, maybe you don't know this. Maybe you didn't realize that when you join with somebody, you are making a covenant with that person to be able to be there, but you're not submitting yourself to that covenant. And what forms is something that is probably one of the most destructive things in the body of Christ and in our world is called a soul tie. And many people are in here are tied emotionally, physically, and thoughts. You hear, you hear a song and you go back to a place. You smell a certain smell. They used to wear sweet pea from Bath and Body Where You smell that smell. No, I'm, I am not playing. And it's t- I want you to understand what an ungodly soul tie is. A soul tie is the joining of one's essential self, mind, will, emotions, thoughts, memories, in connection to someone or something else. Most of us have soul ties from relationships, emotional affairs, all kinds of stuff. You can be soul tied to almost anything. You can, anything that takes the place of God, you can create a soul tie with. And and there are godly soul ties. Marriage is a godly soul tie. He wants you and your husband or you and your wife to be connected on that level. There's even friendship soul ties. Um, um, The Bible talks about in 1 Samuel 18, I believe it is, where David and Jonathan, they were knit to the souls of each other. And they they had a bond that was unbreakable. But can I help you? Just a free nugget. That a sure sign of a soul tie that is good is that thing is helping you live. Can I prove it to you? Jonathan, whose dad was Saul, who was trying to kill David, said, you know what? I'm going to turn my back on my allegiance to my father because I have a soul tie with you. And I want to let you know, if you go to this dinner tonight, they're going to try to kill you. I'm putting everything on the line for you, but I want you to live. And David lived because he had an unbreakable relationship with a friend named Jonathan. My question is, are the people around you helping you live? Are they taking from you? Are they sucking from you? Are they taking you to a place of death? There are godly soul ties, but then there are ungodly soul ties. One of the most, I'm going to tell you just two ungodly soul ties, because like I said, you can be tied to almost anything. But, But there's soul ties to substances. That people try to find the peace, relief, healing that they need in man made objects and things. Last night, my daughter had a birthday party, and so I went to go get some Chinese food from the little spot I go around here, and it's right next door to the liquor store. And I don't drink, so I I don't know, like, what it is to go and get stuff from the store and stuff. It was 745, y'all, and it looked like Black Friday at the liquor store. Now, I don't judge anybody for what you're doing. I'm just praying that that thing does not own you. But, but, But this is the thing. I had never seen so many people. It, it didn't, this substance didn't care about how much money you made. There were people driving up in Audis and Mercedes and people walking with all the clothes they had on their back, going in here trying to get relief from this world. And I sat there and I began to almost cry and pray for those people because they have a soul tied to a substance. But I think we serve the God of all power. 
Like, I, I think that's why the first point was that God has all power over sex, over substance, over anything. But we got to break that soul tie. Another one of the biggest things is people have sexual soul ties. So I brought this bed up here because this is one of the greatest places of the enemy destroying purposes. Because what happens in this bed is people many times are not committing their lives to a person. They are committing their lives to pleasing themselves. And what they don't know is every time they get up out of this bed, not married to that person, they are joined to that person. And it would be like if I had sexual relations with the whole front row, men and women, because that's the type of world we live in. And now I'm trying to go after God, go after purpose, but I have 15 ties that are connected to me. And I'm trying to run and I want to get away, but somehow it just won't let me go. And somehow I keep trying to go after it and I'm trying with all my might. But that's why we need the God of all power Amen. to come in and disconnect us. And there's many of you the same, Pastor Mike, I just don't have any of those things. I don't have ask God to show you if there's anything that you're tied to that is keeping you from what he's called you to be. Because just like this piece of paper right here, this is a perfectly good piece of paper. But last night in the dark, this paper was connected to another piece of paper and they were joined together. And now I'm done with it. I don't want to be joined to you anymore. I don't want to be joined to you anymore. Well, fine. We won't see each other no more. Well, we got a kid. Well, I'll see the kid, but I won't see you and I'll just keep moving and all that. And we try to disconnect. But when we try to disconnect, what we don't realize is that we're still connected to each other. And I've been trying to get away from this and I can't even find the option to be able to do it. But even when I do, I find it a piece of me is always left with a piece of them. And what ends up happening is we try to self-medicate and try to figure out, but I just can't get you off of me. I just can't find a way to tear you away from me. And what ends up happening is we leave our lives connected, broken, battered because we're trying to get away from something that has been connected to us on a spiritual level and God's the only one that can change it Amen. so pastor Mike why are you going so hard on this because I want you free and, and like Paul said maybe you didn't realize now after you know this and you go out and do whatever you want to do cool, 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 cool but I didn't know and I want you to know so what I'm supposed to do pastor Mike I've been living like this for 20 years. I've been living like this for five months. I've been living like this is all I know. Well, Paul knew that these people had been doing the same thing and they really loved God and wanted to change. So he gave them probably the most emphatic instruction that could ever be given to anybody when it comes to getting free from sexual addiction, sexual soul ties, all of this. I want you to see it in verse 18. And you might want to underline this. Run! Run, not walk, not skip, not intellectually digest and then be able to ponder until it becomes a fruit of spiritual awakening and run. Run from sexual sin. Listen, if I thought somebody was coming here to shoot us or I seen somebody from the audience that you didn't see, I said run and I went like this. Everybody over here would start running. They'd be like, why are we moving? Why are we? Why, what? Because in the threat of something that can damage your entire life, you ask questions later. In, in the threat of something that can ravage your whole family for generations to come, that iniquity and that transgression being passed down, you are not worth, baby, my entire family lineage being destroyed, our purpose not being reached. So what am I have to do right now? Run, I got to go. And some of us have been casually walking away. From, I'm sorry. I'm going to miss you too. I, I really want to be with you. And that's why we get lured back in. It's not enough distance between us and what kept us. Run. Run from all sexual sin. And I want you to understand the why right here. It says, because no other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does 
for sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Y'all hear me. In God's eyes, homosexuality, liar, greedy, all of that's the same. But so he's not judging you like they're good, they're bad. They're, it's just sin. And he said, I sent my son for all of that. Accept me. I got you. But there are consequences that differ for us for the sins we choose to do. And the worst sin to do to yourself, the devil out to get me. No, boo, you're out to get you. Because the greatest sin against your own body is sexual immorality. And again, I say it, maybe you didn't know. Do you not realize? He said, do you not realize that your body is the temple, the house, the place of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God. More than this church and this parking lot is the temple of God. This is the temple that houses God. If this whole thing burned down, God say, what, what happened? What happened? Oh, my church is fine. Because it wasn't the building. It's us. And he said, maybe you didn't get it. I mean, in this just few passages of scripture, he says, do you not realize four times? Like, don't, don't y'all get it? You're the temple. So when I lay in this bed and I get tied to everything, I tie the Holy Spirit down. When, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I move in my feelings and try to get my own sexual urges um, um, fulfilled and all that other stuff, what I do, I'm damaging the temple that houses God. And just maybe you didn't, maybe you didn't know. But today God wants to bring clarity to it. He said, you don't belong to yourself. I, I want you to see that. Put the scripture up there. Verse 19. It says, you don't belong to yourself. For you were bought with a high price. See, when God sent Jesus, that was the payment. The eternal payment. For God to own us, for him to come in and be able to change and have power over our situations. And he said, I didn't send one of my sons. I sent the only one I had because you were that important that I'd take care of this debt forever. And when you receive my grace, he says, I need you to realize that you were bought with a high price. So now you have a response. I need you to honor God with your body. Put that back up there. They need to see that. I need y'all to see this scripture. This is not me just talking. For you were bought with a high price. So your, your only response is not to connect yourself or watch things or do things that would take you from the purpose that God has for you. It's to disconnect from all of those ungodly soul ties and honor God with your body. So Pastor Mike, what are you trying to say? The problem is that you still own you. See, you were bought with a high price. Anytime you buy something, you own it. But we're walking around like we own ourselves. This is my body. This is my life. This is what I want to do. I'm grown. I'm this. If I, if I need to do that, I'm going to do that. This is me. And God said, no, baby, you were bought with a high price. But if you still own you, you manage you. And if you still manage you, you have to deal with you. And you don't have the power to deal with you. You've been trying to do it for 15 years, and it still ain't work. So what are you trying to say, Pastor Mike? My last point, God only can manage what he owns. If anybody's ever had an apartment or a house that they rented from somebody, the key to doing that is having good ownership. Because if something breaks in the house or something gets damaged in the house, you're not responsible because you don't own it. The owner comes in to manage that property. And so if you're dealing with sexual problems and issues and urges, you're dealing with anything, fears, um, soul ties to all kinds of stuff. If you own you, you're doomed. But if God owns you, he can bring management to the areas of your life that you have allowed him to own. So my question today as we leave is who owns you? Does sex own you? 
Does fear own you? Because you were bought with a high price. And your only proper response is to honor God with your body, but you won't do that if you think you own you. Does the approval of other people own you? Do soul ties own you? And God says, hey, I'm a good, good father. So if you would give me back what I gave you, I promise you I'll bring management to what I own. There is nothing too big for our God to bring under subsection of his power. But he's not going to take it from you. You have to give it to him. 